Welcome to the MBM Blog. We are absolutely delighted to welcome Jackie Lanham. Jackie, welcome. Thank you, Darren. This is our blog where we talk to experts and people who practice in the field right now. And we're talking to them about soft skills. So Jackie and I know each other and we have selected a topic, or rather Jackie did, of leading organisational change. Is that right? Good. Yeah, absolutely spot on. <laughs> Good. I thought if we chose another topic, I've really stuffed up the first part of this, but that's okay. We well, could be buying handbags if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about a friend afterwards who did a vlog on all our handbags. No, time, uh, maybe one for another time. We um, have the pleasure of Jackie's company for about half an hour. We have a bunch of Google questions. So these are the questions that people typically ask around this topic. We're going to put them to Jackie. But before I waffle on any more, Jackie, would you tell us a little bit about you, please? Awesome, and, and thank you so much, Darren, for um, inviting me here to have this conversation with you. I'm really looking forward to it. So as Darren said, my name is Jackie Lanham. I'm the Chief People and Culture Officer for Hilton Food Group. And um, Hilton Food Group is um, a premier um, food packaging organisation, um, absolutely focused um, on the protein category, uh, well known in meat also getting well known in fish and also in uh, vegan and vegetarian products as well on an international basis. So um, I love my job. I get the opportunity to talk to people across Europe, um, into Australia, and um, also have the wonderful opportunity of building us into um, new countries, most recently uh, Belgium. Okay. Uh, so in my role, I'm really responsible for um, facilitating our thinking around our people strategy, and really ensuring that our people um, love working for us, are fully engaged in, in what we do, because we kind of know people who love their work, love working for the business, produce the best. Very true, very true, yeah, very true. Okay, and you haven't just worked at Hilton, I'd say just. Oh, no, 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 this, um, this, this, this white hair is earned, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, so I've, I've got into human resources pretty quickly and I have to say, um, I love it. Absolutely found, very lucky to find my forte really early on in my career. So I've worked across um, retail uh, for the cooperative and, and Tesco um, within the UK. And also I've worked on an international basis within the financial services sector. So a um, period of um, 11 years with JP Morgan Chase and a period of seven years with um, also Aviva um, in the insurance sector. Yeah. So I think what I absolutely adore about, you know, the profession I'm in is the fact that, the, you know, it's pretty transferable across different sectors. And I think I'm at my best when I'm working in businesses that are absolutely focused on delivering to the customer. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I enjoy doing and, and really working with businesses who, who have that kind of at their heart. Brilliant. I, I'm going to go off at a slight tangent and, and hopefully you'll be okay with it. <laughs> I'm looking through my, not now, but I was looking through my LinkedIn feed and there are people who are changing jobs and thinking HR might be for them. So I just want to take you back a few years to when did you know you wanted to get into HR and why did you think it was right for you and what's your advice for those people that are thinking, do you know, I might have a good go at that. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, I'll, I'll tell the true story. So the true story was I, um, I graduated in English literature and history. Wow. And um, at the time I graduated, people were going, well, what, what so you say you're going to be a teacher? You're going to be a journalist? And um, I had a bit of a flirtation with being a journalist and worked out that I wasn't really tough enough for doorstepping and all of that kind of stuff. And went back to the University Career Centre, filled in one of these online things you, you, you fill in. Actually, it wasn't online. It was paper and pen at the time. <laughs> there we go. And uh, the results came out. Oh, you could probably do marketing or personnel. And um, I looked at marketing, thought, well, that looks quite interesting. And I looked at personnel and quite like the fact that I could get another year's education um, with a qualification. So I decided to go back in and, and do my postgrad um, kind of focusing on what was then personnel. And I think what grabbed me in terms of loving it was just the sheer variety. Um, the, the fact that one moment you're recruiting, the next moment you're helping somebody perform better. Um, you're doing that at an individual level and also at an organizational level. 
and and also you get to work at, at very senior levels within the organization um relatively young in your career which yep. is fantastic yep. as well so you get a real insight into the strategic direction and, and the commercial direction of organizations i think human resources gives you the flexibility to not only work within different sectors you can also work within different components of human resources now it's really i think developed as a function so if, if you love numbers and you love reward you know you can kind of have that analytical reward route if you love more the training and development side then again you've got the opportunity to look at how you bring an organization along or, or individuals along from that perspective and um, you know i could i can name so you know we're diversity and inclusion now all of those types of things gives you the opportunity to specialize if you wish work as a generalist if you wish and then work across different sectors and um what I've loved is the opportunity as well to um, look at how I can manage my career to different stages in my life as oh, well. Okay. So, you know, as, as I have my son, you know, I can start to think, well, actually, I think this is time for me to specialise a bit more because I can manage my time. My time is more on my own. Okay. Yeah, um, whereas when you in a more business partnering role, I can tell you it's not so much your own. So, <laughs> again, it's, a, it's, it's another stage of stage of your um, life in your career. So I just I just love that flexibility. And obviously, you know, people can take it into their um, their own businesses, you know, running fantastic consultancies like you do, um, or indeed um, looking at how you might be an independent consultant as well. So, um, yeah, I just I just think it's opportunity rich and I've just absolutely adored it. Brilliant. And, and uh, just coming back to if I'm a HR, I'm not, but if I was a, a person wanting to be a HR manager, uh, what was the one thing that and regrets too much what's the one piece of advice you'd say to them you should go and do that you should try this you should what is it what's the thing i i think it's dip, dip your toe into everything i think probably yeah i think a regret is a really good question and very um a couple of times early on in my career i was given the opportunities to work internationally right. now i've been lucky that um i've done international roles and i've been able to travel into countries and and spend periods of time but at least on two occasions, you know, I was offered a, uh, the opportunity to work in New York, offered the opportunity to work in in um, in Holland or Netherlands, sorry, and, and never took it up. And I think if I look back, I kind of go, yeah, do you know, you should have just pushed yourself a bit further okay. on those things. Right. So I think, you know, trying to really widen your experience as much as possible is, is really important. And um, we live in a very small world now. So the more... Uh, experience you've got of working with different cultures um on on an international basis i think the better in terms of your career good good advice all right well i'm thinking that we could do 40 minutes about you because i i am fascinated no we might do that for another <laughs> one let, let me just come back to our topic for a moment because i've got about a thousand other questions and, and the people are thinking hold on well, you're going to talk about this now you talk about that so leading <laughs> leading organizational change um let me ask the stupid questions what the hell does that mean <laughs> it sounds like something out of a book. <laughs> what does it mean? Leading it does, doesn't it? And there's there's also this piece around yeah, there's all there's also this piece around I don't want to sound passe, but change change is, is constant, it absolutely is. And I think for me around leading organizational change, it's around you always need to be on point because there's always going to be change in play. Okay. And um, yes, there'll be big change there'll be small change. And if you as a professional are not always looking at how you can do things better, how you stay relevant, yeah. um, then at some point you'll be extinct, the business will be extinct. And we've seen lots of examples of, of that in, in history. Um, you know, if we, if we look at how, um, it's the easy one, isn't it? How technology has lifted us off to a, a different place, the impact that's had on retail, for example. Those retailers who, have not quite grasped that yeah. are in quite a difficult position and they were in a difficult position pre-COVID. Right, right. So I think for me, um, around leading organizational change, it has to be in your kit bag on a 24 seven basis. And the minute you get complacent is, is the minute you start to become not successful. And it might be not successful in the next few months or it might be not successful in, in, in years to come. So for me, that it has to be part of, of, of your toolkit, whatever role you have within a business. Okay. That constant focus on how can I always do it better? How can I make sure I'm absolutely relevant as an organization or as, a, as an individual? 
when you were when you were talking the one that came to mind was a tech example but i was thinking of blackberry i had about 15 blackberries i think during oh. maybe the 90s yeah. or the early thousands i can't remember and then they just went <clears throat> you think wow that's it how did a company that owned 80 of the market just go off the cliff wow, wow, wow. It, it it's it's absolutely scary and that's why i think it's essential to always be looking at, at your health internal health as a business you know, as, we, as I talked about earlier now, how are people feeling around here? You know, how are we meeting the needs of our customer? But it's also incredibly important to, to look at the external environment as well. You know, it's a bit like your own body, isn't it? Are you breathing the air well? And is the air that you're breathing in good fresh air? Very true, very true. You know, so, so, so for me, it's, um, and I, I don't want to uh, make it feel as though you have to be constantly restless, but I think the more curious you are, the more interested you are, the more relevant you're going to continue to be, and um, yeah, as we've you've, you've rightly said with BlackBerry, and there's lots of other examples that we could probably come up with that between the pair of us, where you know for whatever reason the the eye's gone off off the ball. But there's also some great reinvention stories. I mean, you look at IBM, look at how they've reinvented themselves. That's good. Yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. So there there are good examples there where people have kind of sat back and said, hey, hang on, where's our relevance? What what do we need to do going forward? And that's something Hilton Food Group has done, you know, in terms of you know, starting off within the red meat business. And then we look at how we've now developed into looking at other proteins and, and in, ancillary services around data and that kind of thing as well. The, the, the other exa example that came to mind was when, when I was young, I had a cold. Mum sat me on the sofa and gave me Lucozade with a foil top. Do you remember this? And oh, God, I love Lucozade. <laughs> and, and you only had Lucozade when you were ill. And then must be some bright yeah. spark at Lucozade said, hold on. How comes people Energy. like to drink this when they're ill? Let's boom! Wow. Yeah, yeah. And no, I mean, exactly. That's, that's, you're that's absolutely problem. right. Yeah. yeah, reinvention. Yeah. And I think it was Martha Lane Fox, who was the founder of lastminute.com, who said, working at lastminute.com is like being a headless chicken on amphetamines. Maybe that comes back to your restless part. Yeah, I think there is, you know, and it's like you, you don't want to be restless to the fact where it's really impacting your, your mental health and your well-being. But like I said, just having that, I guess, that healthy curiosity. Okay. You know, what can I learn from this conversation? What What's that telling me? That's what do you think? Incredibly important because, um, yeah, nobody's got the, you know, the biggest brain in the world. You know, the best ideas always come together through collaboration. I think when you're looking at, at leading change, Collaboration is, is, is absolutely essential, yeah, especially as you become more senior in an organization, because you know, back to the point around the customer, unfortunately, you can become more and more detached you know, the more senior you are within the business in terms of what, what's really happening at the front line in respect to our customer. So having those conversations and that, that collaboration is incredibly important to sort of staying alive to what's going on in your system. And I guess that must be particularly challenging you got a business Hilton which must be I don't know 30 sites around the world I don't know how many I'm afraid but you're, you're uh, everywhere, yeah, everywhere yeah. around the world so you've probably got yeah. 20 different cultures in there 15 different languages wow that's tough <laughs> I know it's, it's 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 wonderful I love it you know it's because again you'll get I mean I was having a conversation with one of our managing directors in the UK and um we were looking at how um, he wanted to focus on some Im improvements and immediately said, oh, I can see from our engagement survey that um, our operating company in Denmark is doing some great stuff. How can I learn from Denmark? Yeah, so, uh, so as well as the importance of making sure you're having those conversations, managing through data, I think is very important as well. And you know, so the more we know um, through asking our people what's on their mind and collating those results through, you know, quick pulse engagement surveys can be very useful um, because then you can create some better sharing of, of best practice internally when you see spotlights of really great practice. Plus also in a business of our scale, you can start to see, well, I think I could really, I could really help this particular operating company because obviously they've got some challenges in these particular areas. And how can I take the great ideas that we I see across the business and, and help them with that within this particular setting? So yeah, managing through data when you're looking at change um, can be really important. 
you know, it's back to the whole, um, you know, extinct businesses, you know, how were they talking to their customer around what their views were, you know, what they wanted. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, being informed. Yeah. Sorry, it slightly froze there. <laughs> and it's just coming back. I think there is. <laughs> the broadband's catching up. Okay, it's back, it's back. The people just the, and not... all, all the children have gone online and they're playing <laughs> games at the moment. <laughs> All right, so let's ask you what would be an example of leading organizational change, either this business or a previous business, so people can go, Okay, I can see, I can see me doing that, I can see me trying that. I think that was, um, I mean, I'll go, I'll go back a little bit in my last organization. Um, I worked for a manufacturing um, organization called Wrexham who were taken over by a um, big American conglomerate called Ball. A wonderful um, acquirer, actually, they're really great to work with, but quite frightening because, um, you know, with FTSE 100 business, uh, plants all over the world, we needed to go through um, many a dif a difficult legal um, challenges and issues around um, ensuring that we didn't have any issues around non-competing, all of that kind of stuff. So what we had to do was take the employee base through a change that was going to be difficult for them they might not be in a job it might be a change that was um, not going to happen if it failed in any, in any of the legal jurisdictions so we were kind of set ourselves a real clear vision when we went through this change which is we are going to be a fantastic business whether we are acquired okay. or whether we're not Right. So we, we set a very clear vision. And I think when you're going through change, that clear vision is, is incredibly important. And then what we did was we looked at it through the lens of how am I as an employee going to feel going through this change and how can we best equip our employees um, to face this change as well? And we talked to them about it. We talked to them about you know, what might they need. And this was what I might need as, as an employee in going about my job, but also as a, as a line manager as well, in terms of how I could support my people through the change. And, and that was fantastic to see it come through because we started to put in place uh, conversations, engagement surveys. We kept going with our high potential leadership development programs. Some organizations I've seen in, in play um, where they might be taken over have just cut every single piece of this kind of activity and investment out. Oh, wow. Okay. We decided that we needed our people to be incredibly motivated during this period. And based on what they were telling us, we kept everything in place, but we upped it. So we gave them more tools around how they might manage change personally, not just on the basis of getting your job done, but how you might handle it from a well-being perspective. And we also looked at giving them tools to help them find their next job, which was taking quite a risk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the vision was to, yeah, we wanted to hand over a business that was in, in good fettle to the, to the new owner. And actually, um, all the people that um, the business wanted to stay stayed, and those people who moved on felt that they got fantastic um, support in terms of managing their career going forward. And communication sat throughout all of this. So I, I think that was, well, I know it was successful. Um, because we were clear about the vision, we collaborated with people as we went on, on the journey, and that collaboration meant collaborating with our colleagues in North America, South America, across Europe, mm. and across Middle East and Africa. You know, and it did it did mean a, a few back-to-back um, -back flights over to Dubai and sleeping on the plane, you know, doing change workshops. Wow. But it was it was so appreciated, Darren, so appreciated, which was fantastic. And so to me um the business was acquired and it's gone on to do brilliantly and i have people that worked in my team who are still there absolutely loving it that's a great story great it's because there are um, so, many, so many stories where it all goes wrong and, and that's lovely to hear one that went really right uh, and some ballsy moves in there as well courageous yeah moves. yeah i think so i think the um and it's, obviously we had really great support from 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 the top team there so for me that was um something that that did go well it had a good outcome and it was in difficult circumstances if you think about you know cotter's change model where they talk about you know having that kind of that reason to change that kind of call to action sometimes it can feel as though it's an it's a non-positive it's not about the opportunity it's more about a threat to be overcome and sometimes that can feel 
you know, don't don't scare me into change. Yeah. A bit like Brexit, you know, it's like you know, the, the campaign of fear. So everyone goes, well, not everyone, but a few people go, hang on, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not going towards that. Um, so what, what we did was created the, the, the opportunity. Okay. Yeah, around this as well. Um, so yes, it is a fear that people could lose their jobs. Um, it is a fear that the transaction might um, not work and we could be forever in that place of being looked at as a business to buy. Um, so it was really kind of also sort of presenting the opportunity that gave to people. And I think as well, because we had a good year to work it through, um, people can go through that horrid change curve. You know, they've got the time to go through the change curve and, and work out what this means to them. And so I that, 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 that's kind of a, an, an example I'd probably use. And it sounds like, so you talked about, you hear people go from fear to opportunity and sometimes it's just semantics. You know, we'll change a word and, and we'll sort of uh, manipulate them. But actually what you guys sound like you did there was it was genuine, we can turn this into an opportunity. It is a real opportunity. It's not just semantics. It's right through the business. Okay, I'm just picking that up. Yeah, be, being really proud, I think, having <clears throat> incredible pride in doing and wanting to make sure that that, that legacy is there, yeah. really, no, no matter what it means for the future. I was um, I remember talking to my boss at the time, I said, I don't think I've been busier than, on coaching than ever before. Yeah, and it was it was marvellous because we, we just said, oh, God, wouldn't it be nice if it was like this all the time, people constantly coming to us <laughs> and saying, please, can you coach me? Please, can you give me some, some help and support around this particular area? But anyway, we make the most of it in, 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 in those particular circumstances. I know you're a big fan of coaching. Um, yeah, John, John Whitmore, you're a fan of, aren't you? Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's, um, it's, it's always interesting with coaching, though, and I, I love the purest coaching where you, you really are it's back to curious questions, posing those curious questions to the person that you're working with to really help them then get to their answer. That's the coaching I love. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> our story around that is, um, I don't know, some of these things become urban myth. There was a story around Adrian Morehouse, the, the gold medal. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, and the story goes something like a journalist came into the into the pool, into the area. The coach was on the side. Adrian had double cramp and was sort of half drowning. You can imagine the story get embellished. Uh, and the yeah. journalist says to the coach, aren't you going to jump in and help him? And he says, no, I can't swim. And you just love those type of stories to put forward. Coaching doesn't mean I have to understand what you do. Yeah, exactly. It, it can just be those insightful questions or putting that, that person in a different perspective. You know, I often, um, sometimes somebody talks to me about, oh, it's a really terrible experience. Just saying, well, how did you, how did you feel at that time? You know, and so the silly things like, if you're an animal, what animal would you have been at that time? And what animal would you prefer to be? It, it sounds daft, but it just, it Take takes the, people to a more creative yes, place. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah, and, right. and, and allowing them to move on. So yeah, no, I can, I can talk for ages about coaching. Really enjoy it. Well, we, might, we might come back to that. Let me ask you our <laughs> other question. Um, okay. The first step in leading organisational change, have you got an example and is it always the same step? Probably if I look at Hilton Food Group, Hilton Food Group, fabulously successful business, but really growing quickly. And you know, there, was a, there was a point where we'd got to say, actually, we've got a very small leadership team. That leadership team cannot, on a constant basis, impart what the vision and direction is, is to the business keeping it alive for everybody. We have to start to empower more through the organization um, to do that. And in doing that, we really need to be clear about what, what we're about. And that was an interesting one because usually when, when you're going through a change, there's kind of a bit of a, a clear call to arms, isn't there? There's kind of, there's, a, there's this opportunity, there's, you know, we're gonna go and do some business over here and we're all gonna go for it. Or it's going to be, oh, no, there's a threat coming around the, around the corner. We've, we've got COVID. We know that people are going to be hitting their pockets and we've, we've got to think about providing more value. Um, so this one, it was, it was kind of, well, why, why do we really need to, to be doing this? So it was very important, I think, for us to be clear, going back to the Wrexham case, what, what's the vision for this? What's the reason for doing it? 
I think every change initiative which should start with being very clear about what, what's the why. Because if we're not clear around that, how can you take people with you? And I know there's always ambiguity, there's always ambiguity, but being very clear around what's the purpose of what we're doing here. So, so for us, I mean, this, this sort of poster thing behind me was something we developed to be very clear around this, this is our purpose as a business. This is why we do business. Yep. This is our ambition. And these are the values we hold dear and the principles we hold dear. And there was at the beginning a bit of a why are we bothering? Well, kind of why we're bothering is because we are growing at such pace. We need to make sure everybody that joins this business knows what's important and we know what we need to keep doing. Knows um, how we should make sure we're aligned in, in a similar direction to achieve what we need to for the customer as well. But always doing so where there's, um, I don't really like the phrase, but I use it kind of freedom within a framework. So this is the framework of how we operate. And obviously want to empower people to be able to do things in a way that's right for them, but within this particular framework. So uh, that, that was very interesting to get into and be able to really be clear around that this, this is what it's about, is to ensure that we all know what's important in this business as we start to grow and develop. And in going through that change, making sure that everything we do can be rooted back to it. So if I just sort of concentrate on the um, human resources side of it, it's, it's when we're recruiting, we're recruiting people who kind of like our values. Yep. Yep, because... If, if you recruit people who don't really like your values, then they ain't going to last very long because it's not the right business for them. You know, we have a value about being entrepreneurial. Um, and if, if you prefer an environment that's um, perhaps a little bit slower paced, you know, where you, you have more, more time perhaps to think through some solutions, our, our environments were not right for you because we're constantly being curious around what's the next idea? How are we going to move forward on that? Well, let's try it out. Oh, we might not get that completely right. That's okay. We've learned from it. If that's not the environment for you, then we're not the business for you. And so I think being really clear about those kinds of things is, is important. But at the same time, obviously, we don't want to recruit a lot of people who look exactly the same. Yes. Yeah, you don't but at least we're being clear about kind of the, the, this is what's important to us. Uh, so, yeah, I think around starting the change, it's, it's always about why, being very clear about why, and then immediately after checking in on why does this make sense for you how would you go about doing this would you like to get involved with me on this journey um and it's it's the usual stuff around making sure that when you're forming these teams to work on this type of thing you don't just have your people who are cheering in the stands or cheering by your side you also have those people that will be Oh, yeah, I've tried this before, Jack. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, 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 not really sure about this. But you, you need those people engaged as well because they're, they're going to help you come up with the best, the best solutions and the best way forward. Yeah. Some of those people who have a, what is it, a, a problem for every solution? Oh, yeah, they're wonderful, aren't they? <laughs> you go, what would you do then? Yeah. In my place. <laughs> and they normally answer, well, I don't know, but whatever but you're doing is wrong. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, I know. The, na the wonderful naysayer, but you've got to listen to him. Yes. There'll be nuggets there. Yes, I know, I know. Well, if you can win them over, you win, e win everyone else over. All yeah. right. So, and some and sometimes, um, you can't, sometimes you can't win them over, but if you listen to what they're saying... Yeah. There'll be things there that will help you build a better solution that will help you win more of the larger the larger population over. So I tend to listen. I think, uh, yeah, again, it's an old saying, isn't it? But you've got two of these and one of those. So. True. So start with why. So it sounds a bit like the Simon Sinek. Start with why on leading. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And you, the way you described that was sort of a sense check. We can keep coming back to it. Should we go in this direction? Well, this is why we said we uh, would. We keep coming back. Absolutely. And that sense checking, I think, is really important because um, you get more data along the way. And I think, again, when you're, when you're working through change, you know, I mentioned ambiguity earlier. There, there's good, as much as you can create why there will be ambiguity. And we need to keep questioning why is there ambiguity in order to help start set more direction as you move forward. So I think sometimes people find it tough, which is, okay, what's, there's the goal, I'll, I'll kick the ball and it'll go, it'll go straight in the goal. So 
So I don't know why I'm using football analogy because I know nothing about football. Uh, well, working I, in all foods, I've learned a bit more about football. But there's a bit around, well, who do you need to pass the ball to? Right, yeah. You know, and if you don't pass the ball over to that person and um, you try and kick the ball in, are you going to cause yourself a problem with somebody um, that they're marking, they weren't marking, suddenly appearing from nowhere? So this analogy is not working well, but... I, I like it. I, I, I know nothing yeah. about football. It works for me. <laughs> yeah, but, but it really is. It's kind of this piece around, you know, don't, you'll start off on a track, but you'll get more data as you go down that track. And you may just need to make adjustments. So I think people, when they think in black and white all the time, you know, show me the path, show me the direction. Well, actually, you know, when you're going down that path, there may be some other little routes you want, you want to follow, you know, when you do that. So I think for people to be willing for those, those changes along the way, which means that collaboration, communication both ways is, is very important as, as you're going through change. And as you're going through that change, making sure you celebrate the successes along the way. So I've worked on some change programs that have taken quite a time and I'll have um, occasionally I'll come, come across people who'll go, well, what are you up to? I haven't seen anything different. So for me, it's around, yeah, I know you haven't seen anything different, but I know we've achieved this, we've achieved that, and we've achieved the other. And I had somebody who did that to me in Hilton Food Group. And then um, but 18 months later, they came and said, that's really good, that work we did on blah. And I'm not saying everything goes well. But I also knew they had been a naysayer on the way. You know, when, when are we going to see? When are we going to see anything? It can take time. So you have to you have to give yourself your little successes along the way, and you have to give your credit to the team along the way, and your thank yous as, as you're going on this journey as well. Yeah, and there's a little bit of hold your nerve. <laughs> so it's a bit about celebrate success, hold your nerve, and, and the other bit that resonated with me was someone once said to me that an airline pilot. Um, they are 80% always off course because of the wind, other oh, things, blah, that. blah, blah. Oh, okay. But they're always going that way, but they're slightly off course all the time, but yet they're still going yeah. the right direction. It's like, oh, yeah, that yeah. Okay. I like that. I'm going to steal that one. No, that's very good. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's, that, that's a really good one. And I think as you, and as you go through this, uh, is you have to be really real with people and authentic. And if something's not going well, it's not going well. How can we make it well? You know, be, be very honest um, and obviously um, sometimes that can be a bit scary but we're, we're dealing with adults here and I think you know we as all adults would rather know what what's the real story around here and how can we then work together to, to resolve this issue if, if, if the change is, is um, presented on the basis of, of a threat you know let, let's be open about what that threat is and how can we marshal together in terms of, of meeting it and, and, and overcoming it and yeah. And that collaboration, I don't think is just about collaboration. It's also how, how can you devolve as many decisions as down, down as possible? People love being empowered. Yeah. yeah. So, so what is it that they can do, they can contribute as well when, when you're going on this journey? You know, it shouldn't be all about um, what I would call kind of archaic, I'm the leader, follow me. Yes. It's kind of how are we working together on this? You know, what's my contribution going to be? And, and in that way, we learn and grow. And we make the mistakes along the way as well. That's good. That's good. I'm going to ask you our last question because I'm aware of your time. Okay. My last question that's come up is, which leadership style is best for change management? I'll make sure I got that right. Which leadership style is best for change management? That's, that's the last question that everyone um, seems to be asking. I, I will just, I will just, I don't think there's one thing. I think there's a number of things. I've said collaboration a lot. Yeah. The big thing for me is curiosity and also always wanting to do things better and allowing, allowing those mistakes, allowing that testing. And I think for me at Hilton Food Group, um, I remember early on a, a colleague had not managed something as, as well as they'd want to manage it. I was only new in the business and I thought, oh, crikey, I think I'm going to have a very difficult conversation with, with, with the colleagues and boss around their future career. The boss said, are oh, they really going to learn from this? And that to me, I went, you know, this, this is the company for me. 
you know, that real entrepreneurial willingness to, to let people, you know, have a go it was just it was just marvellous. And I think, again, as, as a leader, you, you have to promote that and support at the same time when things don't go as right as they could have done. Yeah, so there, there's, there's, those are some of that, that, that's a mixture for me, really, Darren, that would be what would be in my head as some of the, some of the really useful things. There's not one style, and there's probably six or seven attributes that you've listed there, which you think are important to lead the change. I, I think so, and it depends, it can depend on the situation um, too. You know, if, if you're one dimensional as a leader, then you're not going to be successful. You have to flex to, to, to what your circumstances are and also who you're leading. So, you know, if you're working with somebody who perhaps has a, has a lot more experience, you're going to work with them in a different way from somebody who's, who doesn't have as much experience. Yeah, so you, you kind of got to flex and listen and collaborate and back to being authentic, all of, all of those types of things. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Leading organisational change. Um, if we had another 30 seconds with you, that'd be great. What would be one last nugget you'd like to leave these people with that are interested in leading organisational change? Here I've got an expert, someone with lots of experience, made a few mistakes, lots of success. What would you want to leave them with? Always be curious, cool. internally, externally. Um, if, you, if you lose your curiosity, then um, you're extinct, I think. Brilliant. Yeah, which sounds a bit frightening. <laughs> the, the minute you stop asking questions, I think that that's the moment to think, is this really interesting to me? Am I doing the right thing? And, and you can almost imagine back to our story before of BlackBerry, someone just didn't ask the question they probably ought to, which is, is this really gonna be relevant in five years? Well, exactly. And if it's, it's tough with strategy now because there's a lot of um, sort of reading that I do that says, oh, you know, you having these fixed strategic plans for the next five years is, is not the right thing to do. And I don't think it's around having a fixed strategic plan. It's around scanning right. the horizon all the time. And it's a bit like that healthy body thing, isn't it? You know, you've got to have health, healthy lungs and the air that you're breathing in has got to be healthy as well. So you should look... look I think you should look at that from an organisational business perspective too. All right. Jackie, actually, I'm going to ask you one last thing because I've just remembered. I think you um, have been nominated for an award, but I can't remember. Is it the Meet Women's Award? Oh, uh, um, what it was was, no, we, um, we, we're we now um, sponsoring Meet Business Women. So, um, yeah, be through that. Yeah. So they very, very kindly asked me um, to present at their um, last conference, which had to be virtual because that's the world we're in at the moment. And uh, which which was lovely of them to do and fantastic organisation. And um, what we'll be doing is, is sponsoring them over the next um, two years or so um, and hopefully longer to really look at how we can promote women's careers within the meat industry. Um, because we have a dearth. So, you know, if we've got lots of great men out there, we've got some great women, but we'd like some more great women. Brilliant. And, and if we if we plug them, is there a website that these guys have got or a Facebook or a... Uh, yeah, uh, Meet Business Women, you can um, find them via LinkedIn and um, they'll be doing some more work on um, websites and all of that kind of thing. And um, we, along with a number of other organisations, will be um, helping with them with that on sponsorship, like I say, sort of starting next year. Cool. All right. Well, we'll add the link uh, beneath in the uh, YouTube comments so you can get to that easily. Yeah. I've taken yeah, up much more time good. than I said. So, Jackie Lanham, that has been fabulous. You've answered all our questions oh. people have asked, which is brilliant. <laughs> I've put you on the spot and you've done fabulously. So, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Darren. It's always great talking to you. Take care. All right. You have a good Christmas. Bye.